Good morning and welcome uh, to our Fast Track Friday Hangout. And good afternoon to you guys in the middle of the, of the country. Appreciate your coming out to our Fast Track Friday Hangout. Today we have our team over at Daytron Dynamics in New Hampshire today doing Tech Day Live, Art to Part. Uh, we're going to show off some collaboration between the East Coast and West Coast uh, as the teams are building a guitar and components for that guitar. Uh, we have Dan DeMajor uh, at Daytron who's uh, running the machines over there. He's the application technician. Uh, he's going to be on with us today to talk a little bit more about some of the Daytron machines. Uh, and we also have Amanda Fowler who is uh, our Boston Build Space CAM tech support person. She's an amazing machinist and loves our CAM and works really well uh, with our team. So we're going to talk about Fusion and how she uh, helped the team with collaboration between the East Coast, West Coast. And she's going to walk through that part, designing it up and showing the tool pass. Uh, also, I just want to mention, we also have Marvin, who's in the, our audience with us today, who's going to be doing a class at AU this year. He's also with Daytron, so welcome. It's good to see you in the audience. Uh, so guys, uh, before we get started, I want to thank Dan and Amanda for being here today. Thanks, guys. Very, very good. Thank you, Wayne. It's, uh, it's good to be here. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. It's great to have you guys. So I just want to do a couple quick poll questions for our audience because we like to do this each week because we want to find out the best way uh, to keep our webinars as well as development abreast to what our audience needs to help them grow their business. So what I'd like to do is ask a poll question of this audience. Uh, if you can let us know, what is it about our software that's going to help you grow your business? So if you're using two to three axis milling, if you need to see more of that in our interfaces, please let us know. If you're working with, uh, you're trying to get into more fourth and fifth axis uh, milling positional, or you're going to do true fourth, fifth axis, and that's something that's going to help you grow in the future, let us know. Give us that feedback. And we take this information and we bring it back uh, to our development team. And it also helps us to know in the future uh, what type of content you're looking for in these webinars. So as we do training videos and we do classes, especially at AU, we uh, are able to know exactly what you guys are looking for to be able to, to present those classes. So it looks like a, a good majority of you have voted so far. I really appreciate you getting your votes in. I'm going to close this one out. And I'm going to share that real quick with you guys. So it looks like we have a, a good portion of our audience uh, who's looking to see a little bit more in the two and three axis milling area. And that's where it's going to help grow your business. And it's good to see uh, that we're, we're able to do that because that's one of the places where our, our interfaces are really strong in CAM. Thanks for voting, guys. We really appreciate your feedback. Uh, another question for you guys, and it, it does have to do with Autodesk University, because a lot of our classes and a lot of these fast track hangouts we do add up to Autodesk University, which this year is going to be in November 14th through 16th at the Venetian in Vegas. So we'd like to know if any of you have been to Autodesk University, if you've been there to experience uh, our, our, the Autodesk University uh, lectures, or if you've been there to see any of the hands-on classes that we've done, uh, in the past year, it was, uh, or last year, it was very CAM, I should say in the past couple of years, it's been very CAM oriented, a lot of machinists, uh, a lot of our elite users who you see out there uh, every day in Instagram making some amazing parts have been part of Autodesk University and sharing their knowledge. And uh, we have keynote speakers, we have seminars, machine tool partners have been there and, uh, and you'll see classes and you'll be able to get your hands on training as well. So it looks like we have a lot of the people who have voted, and I'm going to share this. I'm going to close it out. Thanks again, guys. It looks like uh, we have a good larger half of the audience who uh, is going to be busy using our software and, and making parts to, to keep the, uh, the machines going. So uh, it looks like we have a good 30% um, uh, almost who'd like to go. They just want to get more information on how to go, and we can make sure we get information out to you on how you can join. Thanks, guys, for getting that feedback. Uh, so... I'm going to hand it over to Dan, who's going to give us a little bit more of a background on Daytron and uh, what's happening on their tech day today at Art the Part, and a little bit more background on the machines themselves. Very good. Thanks, Ryan. So, uh, yeah, as it says here, uh, my name is Dan DeMajor. Um, I've uh, been growing up here in Massachusetts for the past 30 years, um, and uh, my previous uh, line of work was actually in automotive repair, so I worked at dealerships. Uh, working on Nissan's Mazdas and the like. Um, so I have an education in automotive technology. And um, I'm, I'm not going to harp on that because that's a good, honest living. But um, 
sort of, I, I wanted to change direction for some of these reasons here. Um, not not very challenging in terms of uh, mental challenge. It's, it's a lot of hard work. That's the hard labor, not to knock that at all. Uh, but not good for your body, bad on your back, bad stuff you're breathing in. Um, and you, you don't get to exploit any of your creativity. If, if, you, if that's your thing, making things, which this is what Fusion is all about, being a maker. Um, so it wasn't very rewarding for me. So just a, a little background on that, why I decided to, to change direction. So I was quite lucky um, that my, my brother actually happened to start working here before me in sales. Um, and when he was able to get me here for like an open house event, I was able to, to see how amazing CNC was. Uh, growing up, my father was a machinist. Um, and it was sort of like, you know, you'd go in there as a kid and you'd get these, this swarf stuck in the bottom of your shoe and everything was dirty and nasty. And you'd thought, this isn't what I want to be when I grow up. But this uh, sort of my, my time here at Daytron has opened my eyes to the, the world of machining in general. Uh, and, and sort of limitless possibilities and tons of stuff to learn uh, and uh, master. So uh, very lucky to, to uh, get the chance to interview here and start here in service and work my way into applications. Um, so that's what I do today. I, I do installations, uh, training for, for new customers or existing customers, demonstrations to sort of prove out a machine, be it like cutting a sample part uh, to something off the shelf or cutting the customer's part. Um, and then also some industrial automation solutions. Um, so if you need a turnkey solution, uh, that ends up being my job. A lot of programming. Uh, we have to work closely with uh, integrators to, to make perfect uh, fixturing, things like that. So it's a really uh, involving, demanding job, but I love it. So a little bit of history about the company. Uh, Datron AG was established in 1969, making electronic parts. Um, that's sort of vague, but what I can tell you, uh, what, I, what I do know is that some Datron went into space uh, up on, a, on the space shuttle back in the day. So, so Datron is in space, floating up there somewhere. Uh, in any case, in 1988, uh, we got into manufacturing CNC machines, and it happened just how a lot of machine tool manufacturers uh, start. They needed a machine to make their own parts. Um, so we needed to make a machine that was highly efficient at making enclosures, electronics enclosures, front panels, things like that. Uh, and that's sort of how we got our start, was building a machine for ourselves that everybody else was, was sort of fascinated with. Um, so it grew from there. So now next year will be, what, 30 years of, or, or more of making CNC machines. Um, and in the U.S., uh, we started here in 2000, uh, sorry, 1995 in Toronto, Canada. Um, that was founded by Bill King, who moved the company into Milford, New Hampshire. Uh, it's, it's close to Manchester, uh, if you're familiar at all with the, your airports, uh, Manchester's uh, and Logan. So we're, we're, we're not too far from Boston, about an hour away. And then in 2013, we opened up a, uh, a sub-office in uh, Livermore, California, uh, for all our West Coast um, companies. Um, so just to give a quick idea of, of what we offer, um, Datron is definitely not a machine for everything. Um, there's a bit of confusion about what, what we do really, but what, what I can say in general is that we offer primarily all high-speed spindles. I mean, the low end is 30,000 and we go up to 60,000 RPM. Um, we offer the flexibility of having um, a very small footprint for a very large work area. So we go as small as 400 by 500 millimeters, so that's like 20 by 17 inch, something like that. And as large as 60 by 40 inch or larger on our ML cube series. Um, we offer a precise machine uh, in, in every way, shape, or form. We don't sell a machine that will hold less than a thousandth over its entire work envelope, uh, including the ML cube here. Um, so, I mean, we have machines with linear scales that will are advertisable down to a few microns over the entire work envelope. So extremely precise. Uh, and something else we also take pride in is our vacuum work holding. Um, because we're working with high RPM spindles, um, we're able to get away with cutting a lot of things on a vacuum table that you generally wouldn't think of. We're able to hold parts that are smaller than a, a penny on a vacuum table and still be able to machine it, which is a game changer for some shops. Uh, and in general, our machines are nimble, uh, quick, precise. Um, I remember Tim Paul said it in some Instagram posts, nothing moves like a Datron. He's absolutely right. So, uh, and real quick, uh, we offer uh, technical consultation and service. So basically, we're a small company. 
uh, sort of niche brand, and we need to be able to back up our customers. So we're not like a lot of other manufacturers that might just give you a machine and then say, have a nice day. It might be hard to get a hold of after that. Um, we're here for support, service. Uh, if it's you know training that is tailored to exactly what you need, that's what we do, uh, or special applications, that's what we're here for. And then just a, a quick uh, reason why Datron loves Fusion. Um, Mark can definitely speak to this, I'm sure, but um, it, the product is extremely easily accessible. And, and for me, the, the reason I like recommending it to so many people, whether they're in the industry or not, is uh, well, I was lucky to be able to get a home learning edition of Mastercam back in the day, five years ago now. And that is, uh, if, if I hadn't received that from one of my coworkers now, uh, Chris Hopkins, then I wouldn't have been able to uh, get into this industry at all. But now, somebody who wants Fusion can get it for free, and the community is so vast um, that there's really no excuse that they can't succeed with it and get into uh, machining or 3D modeling or, or anything really their, their maker heart desires. Um, the software is extremely robust, as, as we will soon see. And I really have to note that the post-processors that Autodesk provides uh, for Datron are spot on. Um, I'm, you're hard pressed to find a better one from someone that you have to pay a whole lot of money to make. Um, so I, I just, there's tons of appreciation out there for that for, for me, just being able to recommend this product that I know will work right out of the gate to a customer. Uh, and then with that, that's pretty much it. We're going to touch on all the stuff we're doing here at Tech Day uh, with Amanda in some of the, the 3D modeling and CAM demonstration we'll be doing. All right. Hi, um, this is Amanda from Autodesk. Um, I do predominantly product support, so uh, you guys uh, may have run into me um, when uh, things break and don't go well. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how to actually go through and model apart from scratch, um, how to do some templating and use A360 a little bit to help us out um, when we're working remotely with people or just any kind of collaboration. So the part that we're uh, running here today is a little guitar knob. I'm going to actually draw this from scratch, so I'm going to close out this one that we have. I'm not going to save anything there and uh, start to model it. My background is mostly in machining. I've done a lot of CAM and taught a lot of classes on manual machining, um, CNC machining, working at different places um, in the uh, tri-state area. So let's see if uh, this makes me a little bit better this time. Sketch through. There we go. So, three millimeters. All right, so really easy to get started. We can get our base object. Uh, we're going to go through and actually extrude out that middle section so that we can cut into it. And um, we can use the same create feature right here. We can select it to be two sides and non-symmetrical uh, non and uh, three millimeters down. Seven millimeters up, and we have our base part without any of our fillets or any of our um, grip sections on it. So we can go through, um, create a fillet on the sides here. Amanda, I think it's really awesome that you could just type in the millimeters and it does the translation for you right in the back there. 
Um, yeah, it's uh, super convenient, especially if you have some dimensions that have to be uh, metric and you're working in mostly imperial, but you have a metric screw size or a metric cutter that you're working with, so you'll come up with like a three millimeter slot. Um, so you can really switch in between them. You can, uh, there my uh, dialogues are. So I can actually change the entire document to millimeters now. Um, we were having some issues this morning with the screens not uh, working, so I think my uh, my pop-ups got lost in the abyss. I think so. Yeah, Amanda, this is this is Tim Paul. I, I have the same issue when I go from you know two monitors to <laughs> one monitor. Uh, sometimes I have to restart to kind of reset yep. it and go to one monitor. And you know that's just what happens with uh, different software. So we'll go through. We'll look at this face so we can put some grooves on the top. Um, and uh, create some circles here, make a sketch on that face, and we'll dimension this. You know we want these uh, three millimeters. We're going to go through and actually um, create a pattern for this. So we'll select our object that we're going to pattern and the center point, and say we want ten of them. Um, and, you know, if I realize I don't actually want 10, I want 8, I can double-click on this icon right here and switch it up to 8, adjust it that way, and pop back out of the sketch. Now, from here, we can hop back to the same extrude tool because we can really use that for almost everything. Um, and you can either pattern a feature or pattern the sketch. Um, it really depends on what your workflow is. I started in AutoCAD a while ago, and uh, I am, I'm more comfortable with drawing everything and extruding to different heights, but some people that start with SolidWorks or start with Fusion or start with something like that would prefer to do it in a 3D modeling environment. So we can go through 4.78 and we'll set this to cut. Um, we want to be in the other direction. And we have most of it done right now. We can go and clean it up a little bit because we don't want all those sharp edges and uh, select fill it. And uh, one of the cool things is if you don't really know exactly what size fillet you want, you just want to break the edge, want to see how it looks, you can adjust everything with the uh, little arrow tool. Sliding in and out, or you can actually put in whatever whatever dimension you want. Um, well, just to get the top edge, keep that from being sharp. We'll throw a chamfer on there real quick, and you can see in a couple minutes we go from nothing to having a full part. Granted, I knew what the dimensions were going to be, so design work does add time to it, but. Um, you can go through and have a, have a good workable model in really no time at all. Um, if you go a step further and you use things like templates, you can have a toolpath just as quickly. So we can go in here and we can see, I have this one done, but there's one over here that the, uh, the guys at Datron had finished in advance. And this is in our A360 menu, so we can actually see that online. We can use that and share with, uh, with other people. So I made this little project just so we can see. You can put anything you really want in your A360 account. Um, I have an inventor part and a SolidWorks part for different but similar guitar knobs. Maybe we didn't decide exactly what we wanted on our, on our guitar. And people are playing with it in whatever software they have. Um, but with... Uh, HSM and Fusion 360, the CAM software is all the same. So you can actually go through and there's a couple tricks that you can do to pull a toolpath from a part on a SolidWorks part that's programmed in HSM works or an Inventor part that's programmed in Inventor HSM and bring it over to Fusion or vice versa. So Amanda, um, if, when it comes so, to yes. uh, solid parts, is there any limitation as the type of files that we can upload? In here, there's you can actually see there's a list of like 100 file types that you can bring in for models. So if I go through and I open up an A360, there's a viewer as well. So we can take a peek at the SolidWorks part. So if 
if I don't have SolidWorks on my computer, I only have A360, and I need to talk to someone in Germany who's using SolidWorks and HSMWorks. We can at least look at the part. We can understand what's going on. If he has something to say about the internal bore, I can take a peek over here and see what he's talking about. Um, so it's nice to have the viewer. It's nice to be able to upload those kind of files. In A360, you can really upload anything or uh, pretty much any type of file. Not everything will work in a viewer, but you can use it to kind of keep everything together and keep everybody involved. So uh, um, we had a question yes. from uh, somebody in our audience who would like to see uh, how you would upload a SolidWorks file. Would you be able to do that real quick? Sure. So I'm in my project already, and we can go and just hit Upload. Add a file, and then we can select anything. So um, I think I downloaded this earlier. So we can... Uh, I think you can do it up here. There. So I don't know what this part is, but I can go through and upload it that way. And here it is. And, so and then if I were to send this over and share, if I had shared Dan into this uh, project, he could open it up on his computer and take a peek at it just as well. So it's a great way to collaborate with people. Hey, Amanda, this is Tim. Uh, so you teased everybody with sharing toolpaths from something <laughs> like solid, you know, HSM works over to Fusion. Um, can, is there, do you have a quick explanation of, of how to do that or, or yep, maybe? that's the next part we're going to get to. Oh, I'll just keep quiet then. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> it's important to make sure we get there. Um, so because Tim brought that up again, we can hop over there. So, um, I'm going to open up a similar yet different guitar knob from, um, Inventor. Um, we've gone through and, uh, let me delete these tool paths. We went through, we designed this, and we had so much luck with the guitar knob that we programmed in Fusion 360 that we want to just use the same tool paths on it. So we'll go in here. These tool paths were already put on here by um, Dan or the Datron team. And uh, we're going to go through and actually create a template from them. So we can go through and select the ones that we want. Right click and store as template. And you see I've already done that for these guys. Uh, but we'll go through. And save that out. I'll go up and open up here. I know where my uh, template files are stored. So we can actually take this one. And all you have to do is change the extension. Um, Inventor and Fusion 360 have all the same parameter names. There's unfortunately a couple that don't transfer SolidWorks to Fusion or SolidWorks to Inventor. Um, but it's still a really great starting point and it saves you a lot of time. So if I go through, I can just go. So we still have this template for Fusion. I'm going to save it and we'll just make a copy and paste that in there. Change the extension to INV HSM template. And that's all we need. So we can hop back over into Inventor, go into the setup, create from template. We'll select our template. I'm already in my Fusion folder because I have directed here several times. But you can open this up. And then we have our tool paths. Uh, there's going to be a couple things that you need to do when you bring them over, just like with any template. So We'll edit this and we'll make sure that our heights are correct. So this is just for clearing the backside. So this is where uh, when you when you make templates, it's a good idea to at least at least be mindful of how you set your heights. So sometimes instead of a selection, if you can get away with maybe using you know model bottom, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times you can you can bring over a template and just regenerate without with fewer selections or geometry selections, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. And that makes it really great for if you have a lot of jobs or if you're um, 
if you work at a job shop and you're just trying to quote things or figure out how long it's going to take the tool pass something, you can throw a template at it, see how the tool pass generate, and get a really rough estimate from there. Um, I've got to select a contour. But another great uh, and it'll tip, you if you mess up. Another great thing about this tip is if that you are currently working with Inventor HSM and you have a lot of your parts and, and already programmed them, it's a quick way to get those tool paths out of your Inventor HSM. And if you're starting to work with Fusion, you can bring those tool paths right into your Fusion part. Yeah, I see a lot of people still using, you know, Inventor HSM works at, at work and they start playing with it at home. Uh, this is a good, good way to, to kind of share tool paths back and forth. Yep, so you can see how quick that was. I didn't have a model bottom set for anything, so I did have to go and set some of that manually, but that was, what, four clicks, and I had three fully generated toolpaths that are pretty much the same as uh, my Fusion toolpaths, so I can basically bring them back and forth through that. We can go through, and if, we, if I was working with somebody, say, that uses SolidWorks, they could go and put their template file in the A360 account. I can change the extension, throw it onto a step file that they give me, and then we have effectively the same part with the same toolpaths. Awesome. Um, yeah, so uh, that's most of what we covered this morning. I went through and showed how to do some tool paths really quickly. Um, as you can see, it's very quick with um, with a template, but it's almost as quick just going from, from scratch. So we'll create our setup, clicking up here. Um, and go through and make sure everything's right. You have the offsets that you want on your stock, um, your program name and number, and your work coordinate offset. Um, Zero or one would give you your default um, G54 usually, whatever's on your machine. Um, and if you increment from there, a one would give you G55, two is G56, and so on and so forth. Um, Let me jump in on that one. So zero yeah. and one, uh, zero and one are the same. So that would be G54, zero and one. And then uh, two is where you start with G55 and so on and so on. Yep. Um, so we can go through there and we can very quickly get an idea just by throwing a 3D adaptive toolpath on this. You can see our heights are set so that the part is entirely inside. We can hit OK and we'll get something. It might not be perfect. We might need to modify it a little bit, but you always get a, a good jumping point. So uh, from there, you know, we have all of the code that we wanted. We could check it and simulate. Make sure that it looks like it's cutting fine. Turn on our stock and you know, so we can see, you know, how it's actually going to cut. Um, and then all you have to do, post out your code and put it on the machine. Post is really simple. All you do, right click on here. There's a button up here, G1, G2. Post out. Um, by default, it's uh, you're set to use a generic post, and you can see one of the uh, great things is there's a lot of posts that come with it to start, and a lot more that you can find online. All of these settings should be fine for what we're doing. We'll post it out. And there we go. So we went from nothing to a part, the toolpaths, and code ready to cut in a couple minutes. So if anybody's looking closely, they can see that that's uh, Datron, you know, uses some pretty pretty interesting code. Uh, my buddy Chris Hopkins on the the West uh, Datron West uh, has shown me how to how to play with this stuff. It's it's pretty awesome. It's not your typical G code that you'd see in in most most CNC machines. No, not at all. Um, and I think at this point, I'll throw it back over to Dan so he can show some videos of uh, how exactly you use the machines. Because the Datron machines have a little bit different um, control than you're used to on most CNC's, um, which definitely to its benefit. Um, so I'll pass over now. So I was talking with Dan this week, and he had mentioned how the, the posts that come with Fusion uh, that were developed for the Datron machines work really, really well. Yeah, it's uh, it was kind of a game changer. I actually went to do an installation in Canada, um, and I had beforehand recommended 
HSM works just because I had heard such good things about the product. I didn't realize that the post processor was like flawless um, and included there's a lot of capability in the Datron control for variables and conditions and all sorts of things that we usually use to make pretty involved uh, like menu structure or, or, or logic for automated um, automated setups. Um, it was extremely useful in this instance. Right from right from your post, you're able to change tools uh, in, in variables, uh, feed rates, just at a glance um, from the, the main macro. So there's just tons of functionality built into it. Not to mention it, it sets up all your, your smoothing and dynamic functions right out of the, the gate um, so that you don't have to fuss around with lots of the nitty gritty details to get the best looking part. Fusion just knows how to, to do it for you, which is fantastic. Had, um, um, Dan, I was just going to mention, I, I had uh, uh, feedback from our product manager who had mentioned that uh, we have one of our top uh, post developers, uh, Akim, who spent uh, yeah. quite a lot of time in Germany at Datron to help develop the posts uh, to make sure that they're spot on. That's just so refreshing from, from my standpoint because most of the time it's, you know, we have to reach out to a cam reseller so that they can cobble something together and, you know, charge you for it. Um, so just for Autodesk to be able to create something like a first class uh, uh, piece of software um, to support our product is just, it's really uh, awesome. So I'm going to play a video right here. Uh, Mark, if you're watching, thank you. <laughs> I didn't have to film this myself, but this is uh, basically the, the workflow for uh, our newest machine, uh, the Neo, which if you went to IMTS 2016, you would have seen it there uh, or gone to East or West Coast offices. We always have uh, them on display. Uh, people love to check them out. So the first part is just what Amanda did, posting out the job. Um, and then either you put on a USB stick or if you have the machine network, you can bring it right over to the machine. Um, I'm going to skip forward a little bit, showing the setup on we have uh, conicals instead of your normal like T-slot table so that you would take a vacuum table in this instance and be able to just bolt it directly down to the conicals and that makes it repeatable to about a thousandth uh, of an inch so it makes for a really quick easy registration of your work piece. So this is our control, this is called Datron Next, um, a previous generation controller HSC Pro which you see on all our MA cubes, ML cubes, M10 Pros uh, um, is uh, a far cry from, from this. This is a brand new control from the ground up um, and is extremely robust and capable um, and, and includes a lot of features uh, that you don't see in a normal uh, controller. Basically it's geared towards um, someone who maybe would never consider stepping up to um, say you know a Haas. If you step up to any normal VMC you might be a little bit frightened of it because of all the buttons and knobs and switches doodads, right? Um, as you can see here, uh, the way that Mark on the screen here is registering his part is using the touch screen, right? So you can drag your finger across the screen and it moves the axes over the workpiece. So your Z axis will locate, X and Y will move, and then you can actually draw the point that you want to probe, right? So right here he probes a corner, measures off his Z height, presses go, and the rest is automatic from there. We'll touch off the surface, probe the edge, Edges. You can even probe two spots along an edge to find the rotation of your workpiece. Uh, you can do the inside or outside of a center, uh, sorry, inside or outside of a rectangle or circle. Um, and then you're able to do some free form stuff. So if you need to move around your probe points and probe very specific areas, you can do that as well. Um, moving on from there, you get a 3D simulation. Not quite as good as Fusion 360, but it's, it's a good start. So that you can see uh, all the positioning moves, all the cutting moves. Uh, and what the final part will look like. And that's generated off the toolpath, so it gives you a good idea if something really went wrong. Uh, it's not based off a of solid that gets imported with uh, the simple file, the, the cut file. Uh, and then from there, the, the program starts. So let me go ahead to some footage I have of the actual part being cut. Hey, Dan, while you're doing that, I can I can say when uh, when Chris got, got the first Neo uh, in Livermore, uh, he let me come in and play with it a couple hours after it was set up, and... Uh, it's probably the first machine uh, somebody's just handed over to me without any instruction, and it was it was kind of like uh, just trying to figure out an iPad. It was right. pretty, pretty neat, just kind of poke around and figure it out. It's, it's strange. Under... No, I mean, usually when I do an installation, it's like uh, I have to spend half a day on, on doing all your probing stuff and setting all your zero points and, and how to do that because, you know, it's, yeah. it's not so intuitive as this. And so now... 
I like to say you spend half a day doing this, and now I can spend five minutes, and somebody knows just as well as I do how to use the probing system. So um, nice approach. So we'll go ahead and play this. This is from the very beginning. The adaptive clear, we're using a three millimeter single flute end mill. And uh, we get asked a lot why single flute. Um, it's our, our tool of choice primarily because at 40,000 RPM, um, you don't need uh, more than one flute a lot of the time in, in non-ferrous materials, so aluminum, brass, uh, copper, zinc. Um, you can really leverage the advantage of this high RPM using a single flute. A lot of the time, if you try to throw a three flute in there, you might end up uh, with more of a chip weld situation. Um, what's really nice about single flutes, too, is that you can almost plunge directly into the material, um, so you, you don't have to worry so much about an entry angle. I don't know how choppy this appears on screen. Pretty bad, I'm assuming. It looks great on my screen. <laughs> if that means anything. Yeah, it's a bit choppy, but it, it's... Uh, Gets the point across? Shows. Yeah, no, it doesn't, doesn't uh, look as nice as it does in real life, that's for sure. Yeah. So anyways, it's doing the adapt to clear here. So 40,000 RPM, we're going about 5 meters a minute, which is roughly 200 inches per minute. Uh, what's nice about the NEO is that uh, the table moves in Y versus the gantry style machine that we typically use, uh, where uh, the gantry moves uh, and the table is stationary. Um, so that allows it to have very, very quick uh, moves. It pulls half a G in acceleration uh, and has a max rapid of 28 meters a minute, which is like 1,100 inches a minute. Um, so it, it, it's, uh, it's quick. So there's some more adaptive clearing here. Towards the end, we have a tool change. We're doing a little bit of clearing out here in the corners. And then real quick, there's a little bit of 3D contouring here at the end. Uh, three millimeter double foot ball, 40, uh, 40,000, probably 35,000 RPM. I have to double check our tool path. But uh, all said and done, uh, the part is completed in, in about 10 minutes. Uh, I still think there's a little bit of room for improvement there, but it, it just shows you uh, sort of this whole art to part thing we're doing is, you know, Amanda was able to, to draw this together in a matter of minutes, uh, and fusion is, is so um, quick quick and easy for, for, for programmers to, to get something, off, you know, out of your head and onto a machine table in just like the matter of a half hour. So, I've seen a, a couple of your Bay Area customers really utilize this, the templates in a lot of what they're making. You know, they're making, you know, one or two parts uh, and their their priority is, you know, super quality but, but also super quick. And, yeah. and a lot of times, you know, you can apply a, a process you know, so quick with a uh, with a template, and uh, maybe delete one or two, or add one or two. But it's it's kind of fun to see how quick they can set up with your your uh, little quick vices there, and then the different vacuum setups you guys have. Yeah, and, and that's part of why we use so many vacuum tables. And and like in this uh, picture here, we're using pneumatic clamps, so really it's, it's shop air, ninety to one hundred psi. Uh, and a lot of people would scoff at that, you know, is that enough clamping for us? But when you play with high RPM all the time, your, your, your chip load is, is quite small. The, the cutting forces are so greatly reduced that you can get away with using a vacuum table with no gasket, for instance, or just soft jaws and pneumatic clamps. So, I mean, that's pretty much it. Do we want to open up for questions now? Wayne? It looks like we might have some. Uh, one thing I just wanted to point out was it's really neat seeing the collaboration. And I know the team on the uh, on the West Coast and uh, your team was working on uh, putting this guitar together and uh, sharing a lot of that information back and forth and even uh, even making templates and sharing that back and forth. So it's really cool to see the collaboration from East Coast. Yeah, West Coast. I wanted to mention that earlier. Here. Um, we had a conference call, Wayne, Amanda, and I, uh, before this event, and this is where I found out about this template uh, ability to go from one CAM software to another. Um, and I was like uh, kind of shocked because at IMTS, um, we, we sort of had to scramble because we realized that Germany was using HSM works and we were using Fusion 360, and we thought there was no way uh, to get 
um, their tool paths over to Fusion. So we ended up having to, you know, luckily uh, some of our colleagues in Germany came through and we had to take a, a single part and S it up as 14 uh, for a vacuum table. Um, and uh, that would have helped, probably helped save the day. Uh, but hey, the more you know. <laughs> It's probably worth mentioning that libraries can be shared as well. So tool libraries can be shared from, from the different platforms. Uh, so, yeah, without having to, to change any file name or anything. And also, guys, it um, uh, looks like Steve Carter had posted a link uh, in the chat window here. So you can uh, always go to that link if you have any additional questions for Dan or Amanda or if you want to learn more about Daytron, you can always go to that link, post questions, and, and uh, also visit their website. Absolutely. So far, it doesn't look like we have any other questions in the panel, um, but i really like to uh, thank you for taking the time today to walk through and give us a background on the, on the machines and the background on yourself. And uh, Amanda, thank you for heading out to Tech Day to help support and show off Fusion and show off our cam. Yeah, of course. Uh, we've been having a great time here today talking to people about Fusion and about the Detron machines. So you're going to have some good, uh, good feedback to bring back to the uh, Boston build space. Yeah, definitely. So it looks like we have a lot of, uh, of our audience uh, giving some feedback that they really appreciate it. And uh, you did a great job today. So with that, guys, uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. And uh, Amanda and Dan, uh, enjoy the rest of the show over there at, uh, in New Hampshire. Thanks, Wayne.